Good morning, everyone. I'm Miriam Hewitt, Assistant Director at the Center for Public Service. Welcome to this session of the CPS Faculty Series. It's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Jordan Karubian, who is going to lead today's workshop on navigating the promotion and tenure process as a community engaged researcher. Dr. Karubian is associate professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary uh, Biology at Tulane and founding member of FCAT, an Ecuadorian NGO. He held the Kailin and Brad Beers Professorship in Social Entrepreneurship at the Taylor Center for 2012 to 2018. After completing his doctoral work at the University of Chicago, Dr. Karubian lived in Ecuador for five years, developing a successful model for community-engaged participatory research. His efforts have been recognized and supported by the Fulbright Fellowship Program, Ernest A. Linton Award for the Scholarship of Engagement for Early Career Faculty, and the Excellence in Tropical Biology and Conservation Award from the Association for Tropical Biology and Conservation. The work has helped establish a reserve for endangered species and provide significant economic and capacity opportunities for locals while serving to advance scholarship and provide training for Tulane undergraduates and graduate students. Welcome Jordan and thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Miriam. <clears throat> and thanks everybody for taking time out of your, your busy schedules to attend this workshop. Um, it's a small group of people here. So there's, that's an opportunity to you know, really sort of gear this to people's wants and needs. So if it's not too much to ask, I would love it if we could just go around briefly. Maybe I'll, I'll mention one person and then when you're done speaking, you can mention the next person because um, and just get a sense of you know where you're at in your trajectory and what it is that you may be hoping to get out of this workshop. That'll help me to, to direct it more closely. So if that's okay, I'll go ahead and jump in there and I'll, I'll ask uh, Alicia to please get the ball rolling. Okay, um, I'm Alicia Battle. I am uh, an assistant professor in global community health and behavioral sciences. Uh, here at the School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine, and I am a on the clinical track. So our my our trajectory my trajectory is a little bit different uh, than a tenure track faculty member. Uh, but I have questions, comments, and concerns. Nonetheless, I am relatively new. Uh, I also serve uh, as the associate dean for online programs, and so as a clinical person with administrative role. Um, I, I, teaching is not all I do. It's a very, very, very small part of what I do. And so it, I just wanting more information. So I'm gonna popcorn it over to um, Ken Schwartz. Thank you. I'm Ken Schwartz. I'm a professor of architecture and also the director of the Phyllis Taylor Center for Social Innovation and Design Thinking. So I got to know Jordan pretty well in his role as a social entrepreneurship professor for several years. Um, I will say I'm here actually because I'm the chair of our promotion, reappointment and tenure committee at the School of Architecture and very interested in this issue, have been interested for almost 13 years now. I came here in 2008 as the Dean of the School of Architecture where community engagement has been a very big part of who we are and what we do and how it figures into promotion and tenure issues for both, fac both uh, track faculty, but also professors of practice and lecturers as well. So I will hand it off to, let's see, Emily. Um, hey everyone, I, uh, Agneska um, shared this uh, session with me. I'm the Associate Director of the Center for Service Learning at the University of Kansas. So I am not affiliated with uh, Tulane, but she and I are in a tenure and promotion working group through Campus Compact. And we are doing some looking at our own tenure and promotion processes regarding community engaged work at KU. So I thought I'd just drop in and see what's happening um, at other schools and, and learn from y'all. Oh, I'll pop over to uh, Paul. I am Paul Hutchinson, um, also in the School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine in uh, the same department as Alicia. Um, I am an associate professor, and at some point I would like to go up for full and would like to know more about that process. 
sorry. Um, I'll hand it over to Pamela. Hi, um, I'm Pamela Sertson. I'm actually at Syracuse University, but um, Adrian from Art History invited me to come. And so I just came to check out what was going on because I, I think of myself as a publicly engaged scholar. And so that's what I'm kind of thinking about more. And this seemed like a good opportunity to engage with that. Um, I don't know who hasn't gone yet. So, oh, um, Mohan. Thanks, Pamela. <clears throat> My name is uh, Mohan Ambitai Parker. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Communication at Tulane. And <clears throat> my work, you know, I'm trained as an uh, anthropologist and I've been working in, a, in the area that is known as activist anthropology for a long time. My first book was based on work that I did as a, a case worker and participant observer in a um, anti-racist organization that help victims of police violence and racial violence, racial attacks um, in London, in the UK. Uh, so, you know, the, my work I feel has um, uh, a foot in, in two uh, areas, both scholarship as well as the, the engaged participant or observant participation dimensions of it. So um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of how that can develop in my current uh, setting and in my subsequent projects and seeing how this might work with the, the whole promotion and promotion process. Thanks. And I don't think Manuel has gone yet. No, I haven't. Hi, uh, my name is Manny Ocasio. I'm a, an assistant professor in pediatrics and adolescent medicine. Um, on a research track right now, and I'm interested in moving over to tenure. I'm a community engaged researcher specifically with LGBTQ youth and young adults of color, um, looking at sexual health and HIV prevention. Uh, so a lot of my work is really out in the field, at the bars, at the clubs, you know, all the fun stuff. Um, so I'm really interested more in understanding how to balance the amount of effort that it takes to do good community engaged research and the scholarship and expectations of tenure um, and how people navigate that. All right, Jared, take it away. Yeah, morning. Um, yeah, so I, uh, my name is Jared Ball. I'm a PhD student at Tulane University in the interdisciplinary department, city, culture, community. You can see the banner behind me. Um, so I'm also a Mellon Fellow for Community Engaged Research. And I work with uh, formerly incarcerated uh, individuals. I'm formerly incarcerated myself. And uh, we have a group, the uh, uh, formerly incarcerated peer support group. And kind of one of the things I'm looking at is what's kind of commonly called throughout the nation, uh, post-incarcerated syndrome. We have so many people now re-entering from the mass, uh, the era of mass incarceration. They're being released now. And, uh, you know, it's just the fact that people had to adjust to prison environment. Now they have to adjust from it. Uh, so, you know, we're dealing with uh, part of its trauma, part of it's just uh, having lived in a total institution for decades. And it's just kind of like a re-acculturation uh, uh, process. So uh, also do some work with post-secondary education in prisons also. So kind of done uh, right now designing uh, like an empowerment evaluation um, where the, uh, it's gonna be with the uh, women uh, population in prison kind of oh, evaluating their college program and getting them involved to do it. Robin, Thanks, Robin. I, think I'm, I think I'm the last one. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Robin Bartram. I'm in uh, the sociology department. I'm in the third year and I'm on the tenure track. Um, and I study housing, housing inequality. Um, and I think sociologists are pretty decent at studying inequality, um, but less in a well-defined kind of community engaged way, or at least that the, there is less definition in terms of balancing that kind of research with um, with tenure and the expectations of, te of the tenure process. So I'm just here to learn, basically. Great. Well, thanks, Robin, and thanks, everybody, for sharing so, so openly. Um, as you can see, we have a, a broad range of, of perspectives and interests and, and needs coming into this workshop. And 
I think that, you know, to my mind, the, the group of people here that sort of fall into two camps and viewed through one, one lens. One is pre-tenure faculty members or people that see themselves as, as being in that position soon that are kind of like, what do I need to do <laughs> to be able to get tenure and at the same time, um, you know, maintain or, or grow uh, my meaningful community engagement piece? And how do I, you know, sort of blend those two um, to be able to, to move forward and, and be productive on both fronts. Um, and then the second camp is people that are post-tenure slash ad administrators that are, are more maybe interested in the actual process by which the promotion and tenure takes place sort of behind the curtain. And how is it that we can change that actual process from an institutional level to, um, to maybe place more weight on or to adequately and fairly um, place, place emphasis on, on the community engagement piece alongside the more traditional metrics that are used for promo promotion and tenure, like number of publications and grants. Um, so in some ways, those are, um, I mean, they're obviously different sides of the same coin and that the one side feeds the other but at the same time it's a very different set of demands i think or, or interests um you know the people that are, are in a pre-tenure position there's a very sort of personal visceral <laughs> sense of wanting to figure this out um whereas whereas and and that's something that you know needs to be enacted soon and immediately um Whereas, whereas trying to change the sort of institutional structures and evaluation process is something that's maybe a longer term process that involves um, a lot more moving parts. And I'd like to speak to both of those um, concerns and, and interests today. Um, and what I've sort of envisioned doing here is talking um, for a little bit maybe 10 or 15 minutes um, about my own personal experience. And I, I just wanna say that the, I, the scholarship that I do is not directly around navigating the promotion and tenure process. That's not, I'm not an expert in that sense, but at the same time, I can speak from, um, from personal experience. So, um, you know, my, my own experience is the following, is I got my PhD in 2001, and I got it in the field of ecology and evolutionary biology at University of Chicago, which is very much an ivory tower sort of institution. And I knew that I wanted to have a, a more real world aspect to my scholarship, that I wasn't satisfied and just publishing papers that I wanted to have in a community engagement piece. And for that reason, I left, um, I, I really thought seriously about leaving the academy. I was sort of one foot one in, one foot out. I ended up getting sort of a hybrid type postdoctoral fellowship that took me down to Ecuador for um, you know six years. I ended up living down there, at which time I formed very strong relationships with local community members in this area that I was working. And that was really sort of the genesis of a community engaged research project. At that time, I didn't even know the words community engaged research. Um, it was a very sort of organic road to developing that, that as those of you who've worked in that, in this sphere before can no doubt relate to, really you know, anchored in and continues to be fundamentally grounded in and in um, relationships with local people from the community that I'm working with. Um, obviously, without that, there's not much that you can do in the context of community engaged work. <clears throat> and then, you know, over time, I realized that I that I did, in fact, really enjoy the um, the scholarship piece per se. And I found I sort of organically developed this model in which I was getting grants to do research on ecological questions. You know, how is it that birds are affected by deforestation and questions like that? And that I was able to use that money 
to employ, to provide alternative livelihoods for locals in the area that I was working with. And by, you know, building on these relationships that I had and empowering, um, you know, local leaders, I was able to, um, to have these local residents work not just as sort of field technicians and biologists, but as advocates for conservation. So they would, you know, spend 50% of their time gathering data and really over time really becoming collaborators in terms of the scientific research so that we would frame out questions together. We would work up together. They are co-authors on the publications that came out and that ended up ticking the boxes that I needed to tick for, um, for a scholarship. You know, I was, I was publishing papers, which is the coin of the realm in the field that I'm in. And also I was using that data to um, not just generate publications, but also as the raw material for grant proposals to the National Science Foundation and other, you know, federal and non-federal sources that really kind of cared about the science. Um, so, but at the same time, I was able to use the income that I generated from those grants to have these people spend 50% of their time doing, you know, education and capacity building and interfacing with local communities, their own local communities and others to ensure that the research that we were doing was relevant to local interests, that people understood why we were doing it and what it meant for them. And just this sort of integration of, of local communities into the research. And over time, I was able to then open up a second funding stream, which is funding sources that didn't care that much about the science per se, but they cared about the community piece. And they also cared about the charismatic endangered species that we were helping to conserve through our work. So then I was also able to get funding from foundations primarily, and also some donors that thought the science was nice, but that what they really cared about were themes of, um, you know, equity and um, education and income diversification and capacity building and you know things like that and so over time i was able to develop this model where i was getting funding from people that cared about endangered species and human communities and using some of that funding to support the scientific work but then at the same time i was getting funding for the scientific work that was generating publications and grants, um, but was I was also able to use that to fund the community engaged work, if that makes sense. Um, so what I'm trying to say, in other words, is that I was able to develop a model in which the community engagement piece and the scholarship piece are mutually reinforcing and the one hand feeds the other. There is a synergy between them. So like, I think it was, um, you know, Manuel, who said, I'm trying to find a way that I can balance these, these, the community engaged piece and the scholarship piece. Because oftentimes, I think implicit in that, in that statement is the fact that there can oftentimes be a tension between the two. That oftentimes you feel like every hour that I'm putting into the community engaged piece is an hour that I could be putting into scholarship. And I'm, you know, I'm not, or every hour that I'm putting into the scholarship is an hour that I could be putting into the community engaged piece. And the two trade off with each other. And I think that the crux of what I wanna say for, for in my own personal experience and what's been allowed me to be successful in this venue is the fact that I was able to find a model in which the one hand feeds the other. And I think that that's, it's an easy thing to say, and it's a hard thing to do, you know, and it's something that I feel, you know, very fortunate about the ways that it was able to come together for me. Um, but it was really, you know, fundamental to my being successful in terms of being able to navigate promotion and tenure and feeling confident and comfortable about it. But at the same time, feeling like I was also having a positive societal impact, which was, you know, ultimately the broader goal and, and what I was aiming to do. Um, you know, so that's a brief overview, I think, of, of what I really think are the most salient points here. Um, 
and I don't want to, you know, talk too long about myself per se. I'm trying to leave it to just like what I think is is the most relevant here. Um, but what what I would propose that we do for the time that we have together is um, is if there's any questions or comments about that, we can have a little bit of conversation about those themes that I just raised, and then I think it would make sense to have maybe break into two different groups, although I could also see us having just one group. We can talk about what we think makes the most sense in that. It's kind of right at the boundary, I think, in terms of the number of people here. But I think it would be helpful to have, if let's say we go into breakout rooms, two different rooms, and we talk about what the challenges are that we perceive on, on a sort of a granular level. What challenges are, are we facing um, in the pre-tenure venue? And then come together and talk about solutions. Um, I think that since we also have a number of people here that are on sort of the other side of the table, so to speak, I, I'll, I'll also, I'll talk a little bit about my experience on, on the other side of the table. And this is much more fragmentary. I have less expertise in this particular front, but it's something that I think can at least get that conversation going. And what I would propose is that we just sort of mash people together and talk about those two things at the at the same time. Um, so I'll talk a few more minutes then about what my personal experience and perception is of the other side of the pieces, which is how is it that the people that are sitting around the table and evaluating these promotion and tenure cases are going to actually evaluate and, and value um, the community engaged piece. Because I guess what I can say is that what I did in my own personal experience is I, is I made sure that I had the, I felt confident going in, in terms of the scholarship piece. I felt like I could be evaluated purely in terms of my, of the traditional metrics of scholarship. And I would probably do okay in terms of promotion and tenure. Um, and that, you know, that made things a lot less stressful for me, I guess I should say. I think that where things get really challenging is when there's this clear trade-off. When you have a candidate for promotion, say to you know tenure, and they're not ticking the boxes that the people are expecting to see in terms of the traditional metrics of scholarship that they're familiar with, whatever those are in that particular field. And then it comes on to this question of, okay, well, but they did do these other you know, they did contribute in these other ways to moving the needle in, on community engagement. And there's these, you know, community reports or these activities that can be, um, that, that this candidate can, can point to. And then the question becomes, you know, how do we weigh those two things? How do we place, um, you know, Ryan, how do we place adequate weight on those? And that's, I think, a really tricky question. Um, and I think it's going to vary based on the particular department and the particular school and the particular university that you're in and who's sitting around the table there. Um, I don't really have any answers to that. But what I can say to speak to that a little bit is my own personal experience here at Tulane, where the provost of Tulane at the time that I went up for tenure was Michael Bernstein, who's no longer here, but he was a really strong advocate for uh, engaged research. And I didn't really know him that well for most of my time that I was here, but you know, through my involvement with the social innovation and social entrepreneurship program that um, Ken headed up, he was aware of my work um, and and he called me into his office about a year before I came up for a promotion and tenure. And he said, look, we've been trying to get the people that sit on the promotion and tenure committee to place more value on community engaged research. And frankly, we have really been having a hard time with it. It's hard to move the needle on that. And it, I mean, if you just think about it for a minute, it's like, this is changing slowly, but it's like a generational change in some ways is my personal sense, because like the people that sit on promotion and tenure committees 
are like by definition, the, the, the more senior people, the full professors, the more senior people, and at least at an institution like Tulane, when I was going up for a tenure five or six years ago, there was a lot of people that were resistant to community engaged research and that weren't, you know, did not embrace it and that actually looked negatively upon it. Um, and my strategy up to that point had been to not even mention my community engaged work as part of my, like when I went up for, in my department, we have a third year sort of like halfway pre-tenure type review um, that takes place. And when I put in my materials for that, I didn't even mention the community engaged work at all because I knew that there were senior faculty members in my department that were actively um, felt threatened by it and didn't like it. Um, so, but, you know, so Michael called me into his office and said, look, we're trying to move, we're trying to shift the way that the promotion and tenure committee it places value on, on engagement. And we have not been successful in doing that so far, is basically what he said. And, you know, I know from your record that you're somebody who you have a strong record of scholarship coming up there. And what I want you to do is I want you to put the community engaged piece right in your research statement front and center. And I basically want you to like ram it down their throats is what he was saying that like, they may not like it, but they're going to take it, you know, and they're going to, they're going to see, they're going to be forced to place value or at least acknowledge that this community engaged work is happening. And I felt concerned about that, but I recognize, I realized after talking about it with some other people that the provost is also the person who ultimately decides the promotion tenure cases, you know, that's, that's, that's where it passes through. So I felt empowered to do that. And I did it. I mean, I put like right in my research statement, I was like, I, you know, I do community engaged research and I, and I made a case for exactly how the one hand feeds the other kind of like what I was talking about at the top of this conversation. And I know from informally talking about it that within my own department, there was, you know, un, people were uncomfortable about that. There was pushback about it. But, you know, it went forward. I ended up at Tulane, the tenure process is a complete black box. So I have no idea what actually happened there. But, um, you know, I got tenure. And more recently, you know, I've just continued to work in that sphere and, and develop in that sphere. And, and recently, like my case right now for promotion to full professor is pending. And similarly in my materials for that, you know, I put it right front and center. I defined myself as somebody who, whose scholarly research, the grants and the papers that they care about, the reason that I'm successful in doing that is precisely because of the community engaged approach that I take. So that's, that's really the extent of my knowledge about the other side, you know, how do we affect institutional change? I mean, I think it's coming, but it takes time. And I think, you know, universities in general, it takes a really long time to change, you know, there's, there's a lot of sort of ingrained um, values and ways that things are done in universities that are, is difficult to change overnight. So, I mean, I think it is changing just because as people come up through the ranks um, and you know start to fill these positions on promotion and tenure committees, you're getting another generation of people that are much more comfortable with um, valuing community engagement. Um, but I think that going back to the perspective of the pre-tenure faculty member and you know how do I how do I navigate this? I think that the goal there, what I think you really want to do, is find a way so that there's not a trade-off between the scholarship, whatever the metrics are of scholarship that your promotion and tenure committee is gonna be expecting to see, you need to try to find a way that, that there's not a, a trade-off between that and the community engagement, but rather that they reinforce each other. And I think I'll just stop right there and open it up to some dialogue, and then we'll see if it makes sense to you know, break out into, into smaller groups to talk about challenges and potential solutions or not. Right, maybe, maybe can I start off? Um, Jordan, thank you. That was very helpful. Um, 
I know that uh, the criteria for going up, to, I think the criteria across all levels of promotion um, on the tenure track, uh, the new provost seems to be focusing on showing impact, um, which seems to be more in line with what you're saying about showing in, uh, engagement. Um, how do we demonstrate that kind of engagement and impact uh, within our field um, beyond just citation counts and things like that? I would prefer to leave that as an open question that maybe some other people can answer. I mean, I have my opinions, but I don't feel necessarily more more equipped to answer that than other people that are that are in the room here. I can um, give it a try from the standpoint of the committee that I serve on and also just numerous cases that have come up over the last 12 years since I've come to Tulane. Um, impact for us, we're an applied discipline architecture and community engagement is very much part of our DNA, especially post Katrina at Tulane. But what I would say is there are really two avenues of impact that can be easily measured. One is the traditional scholarship model where the issues that involve the community actually lead to publication in, in the coin of the realm to use Jordan's expression. We have a top journal, it's called the Journal of Architectural Education. There are a couple of other very good journals too, but that is considered the best. So for example, two people who I hired in my first year as Dean or they came my second year, both of them achieved tenure. And both of them had articles published in the double blind peer review process of JAE. So that's traditional. They, they turned their engaged work into or tied to their research very much along the lines of what Jordan described, but in our own in our own form. The second way is in terms of national recognition and awards. Uh, we're lucky in, in my discipline because the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture, ACSA, has an awards program for new faculty as well as one for uh, community engaged learning. And it really ties into the, the, the synergy between work that's done in a community that has some positive social aspiration, you know, ambitions, with an, an, an architect educator who's doing that work in, in very interesting ways. We also have the Small Center for Collaborative Design, which is a venue for that, that supports faculty to do that work. And literally every assistant professor who we've hired has been handed a project at the Small Center as a way of getting their foot in the door in working with Central City and other parts of the New Orleans community. So I think it's both, the, the both options are possible. That said, I will go back to something Jordan said that ultimately, I think anyone is going to be judged on the basis of, of how their work is recognized within the kind of framework of, of many traditional assumptions about what tenure and promotion to full prof professor means. It's, it's, I mean, we don't have the same struggle that Jordan described. Uh, there's a lot of understanding and empathy for faculty who are pursuing this work. But still, you have to be able to demonstrate up the chain that there is impact that has some legible significance. I will say one other thing. When Jordan was being considered for the SE professorship that he, that he won, I had a conversation with the provost and the dean of his school because we wanted to make sure there, there was some sort of sense like, could this be a liability? I mean, it's a named professorship and it's money, but there could be some forces, and this is before the point where you went up for tenure at Jordan, but um, we had assurances from both the provost and the dean that, that this could be, could be a real advantage to Jordan in his particular case. We've had at least one other assistant professor who has achieved tenure while pursuing SE professorship, Alessandro Asano in, in uh, public health. And you know, there are some really good examples of people at Tulane who have been who have been having the best of both worlds, I guess you would say. Yeah, I think just piggybacking on what Ken had to say, I think that, you know, if you put yourself in the shoes of the person on the promotion and tenure committee, which I have never served on a promotion and tenure committee. So I'm, this is a thought exercise for me, but they, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's, and, and to use the coin of the realm, you know, or the, or the, you know, they're, they're kind of like counting, you know, they, 
they're trying to evaluate you relative to other people in the field and it's made a lot easier for them when there's these sort of units that they can that they can work with they're familiar with you know like they know what a publication in this journal is worth you know and they know what a grant from this funding source is worth but what they don't really know how to evaluate and what makes it really hard for them i think and this is inherently the one of the challenges is is when you get these these other sort of signs of impact that they are impactful say at the societal level um and it is and it can be seen as generating scholarship so i'm talking about let's say that like like one example that i think is often brought to bear in a in the case of a community engaged researcher is um you know you did this research that responds to the needs of the community group that you're working with and you made a presentation to the homeowner you know to a neighborhood community or you know you provided a report to whatever sort of constituency you're working with so it's it's not peer reviewed it's not you know it's it's not a, a presentation at a at a at a conference for an, for a you know for whatever the society is that they're familiar with it's like this sort of other thing that doesn't fit within these categories that they're familiar with they're not able to bin it and that i think is is something that's really challenging for for p and t committees to evaluate and i think oftentimes the easiest thing for them to do is to devalue it or say you know it doesn't it doesn't count as much it's not it's not the same if you go make a presentation to 100 people that are in and present the findings of you know the work that you did on how their community is being affected by you know a certain policy or something like that that responds to the the research needs that they've identified for you i mean like that's that's like outstanding community scholarship but for someone who's on the promotion and tenure committee if you're weighing that against like a presentation that you made at the annual meeting of your of your academic society even if there was only four people in the room there like it's still it's a much more sort of well-defined little box to tick for them you know so i think that's that's part of the challenge that's inherent in this and i think that again you know as an individual going up for promotion and tenure like finding the ways to make sure that the scholarship the, the community engaged work that you're doing is is resulting in those products that they are familiar with the traditional scholarly products is sort of the most this is like the safest policy i would say so it sounds like you're supposed to just work uh, extra hard. Um, you've well, got to, I don't know. You've got to I fulfill, the, the, you've got to fulfill the things that, that, that you want to. You want to do the community engagement, but you also still need to tech, tick the scholarship boxes. I mean, for me, I work in global public health, and my principal funders, the people I work for, in addition to the university, are the U U.S. Agency for International Development, so the U.S. government, and NGOs in developing countries. Um, and so they don't necessarily value research. They would like to be told that their programs work or not. Um, and so that involves some degree of scholarship, uh, but they value briefs, infographics, reports, and presentations to local stakeholders. Um, sometimes uh, scholarly publications come out of that. Sometimes they don't. Um, so I think this is a, it's kind of a hard thing to, to be able to do things that I think are valuable and that also uh, will uh, be valued by promotion and tenure committees. Yeah, I mean, Paul, I think, you know, again, I, I think that um, every single individual researcher that wants to do this kind of work is facing a different set of opportunities and challenges. And I, I certainly don't think that there's any one sort of cookie cutter, you know, type way to do this. But what I would, I mean, in your particular case, um, I wonder if it's not possible within the, you know, within the projects that you're doing to say, you know, 
look to other funding sources or within the projects that you're putting together to, to build in funding for those sorts of activities, maybe for, you know, hiring somebody that can do that kind of work if it's, if it's outside the bounds of, like, I don't feel like I, like in my own experience, I don't feel like I have worked much harder than other than other people in my you know in, in my peers mm -hmm. i feel like we work about the same amount but it's just that again you know i mean it's i don't know it's just the particulars of my situation i guess but but it's it's a, a workflow where i mean really what it's come down to for me i think is identifying these these individuals that are embedded within the community that I'm, that are from the community that I'm working with, that are, that are really, you know, motivated, passionate, capable people that I'm essentially empowering to do. You know, I'm, I get the money for their salaries, and then I just turn them loose. And they love, I mean, they love the research, but then they also love and and are committed to the broader societal work that we do. So they have a real sense of ownership. And that's, I mean, that's something that's maybe particular to my own circumstance of having been able to live for five or six years among these people and really form these, these very solid relationships. But, um, so I'm not trying to make light of, or, or, or minimize the challenges that are inherent in, in finding that sort of model. But um, I, I do think it might be worth, you know, so, sort of evaluating and thinking about what are the things that can be done and getting more funding is, is always one. I mean, there's more money to get the grants, but then if you can hire people that to, to do those pieces, then, you know, that's something that, that can potentially move forward on that. Okay. Thank you. Let's do, maybe we can move on to the next topic. Sorry. I don't know. Does anyone else have a question? Robin, I see you're unmuted. Yeah, I had a question. I just wonder if it's useful. Um, what I, I would appreciate your opinion or anyone else's opinion on whether it's maybe useful um, to make distinctions between, in terms of community engaged research, between where we end up publishing or the kind of the products of our work versus how we actually do the research perhaps versus even how or with whom we design research questions or um, design projects. So thinking about if sort of three different ways of community engaged um, scholarship and maybe each one of those has a different, uh, uh, has its own set of kind of needing to be um, translated to tenure committees, et cetera. I think that's a really good I think that's a really prescient observation and comment. And it's actually something that I've been struggled with a lot. And Ken and I have had some good conversations about this that the, I can just talk about in my own experience, like the model that I described to you was one in which the scholarship that I was doing what had very little to do with the actual community engagement per se. I mean, I was publishing papers about, you know, ecology and patterns of diversity and publishing in journals like, um, you know, like ecology and molecular ecology and evolution and journals like that that had, not, you know, very little to do with the actual community piece that I was doing. And that's something that I, I grappled with for a long time. I continue to grapple with. So what it was like was like, the community, it's like the research and the scholarship that I was doing was a vehicle that enabled the community engagement piece. And the community engagement, similarly, like it circled back around to the scholarship, but they were separate. And that's something that really kind of bothered me or that I was aware of. And it and what I've what I've moved toward since then which has definitely been a process, is a much more integrative approach in which, I don't wanna to get too into the weeds, but basically what I've been doing is forming collaborations with people that work in the social science, you know, in sociology, anthropology, economics, um, to get a handle on the human piece and sort of understand like, what are the drivers that influence the way people interact with their environment in this area where we work 
how does that influence the environment and the natural system? So that's the piece that like we've been doing for a long time. And then how does that circle back around to affect, um, you know, sort of like health and nutrition and economic and sort of well-being endpoints in those same human communities? So understanding those feedbacks, a much more holistic and integrated approach. And there's a lot of reasons why I like that approach and it just makes sense to me. But one of the reasons that I like it is that it, it allows us to really include and make the community engagement an integral part of the scholarship so that we can actually study like in real time you know we can be studying what the impacts of the community engaged work that we do like for example we have one we have like an income diversification project around vanilla production right now in this area in ecuador and we can like we can make scholarly products out of you know what are the factors that influence you know whether a certain family will implement this project or not how did it work out for them economically how does that how, you know, how what are the impacts for you know deforestation rates and patterns of diversity etc so we can you know those are like scholarly products but then at the same time that information it, it goes it feeds right back into the design and implementation of these projects on the ground so it's a much more sort of integrated type of approach but it took a really long time to get there and for a long time, you know, what I was doing like was like the scholarship was here and the community engagement was here. So I don't know, I'd, I'd love to hear what other people think about those, about that, you know, the fact that there can be models that work, I think, when the two are slightly disconnected from each other. I, um, so listening to you, uh, Jordan, you know, I had, I was kind of reviewing my own uh, trajectory through the, the, the third year tenure processes. I mean, I was just on a <clears throat> SLA grant uh, granting committee with the dean, where we almost didn't give a grant because somebody was uh, proposing writing for the Los Angeles <laughs> uh, Review of Books, Los Angeles Times Review of Books, because it wasn't a scholarly um, you know, pub publication. So I, I mean, you know, just some reportage from the field that um, even even in in are arenas where there is talk around rethinking how impact works when it comes to things like grants and stuff like that, that there is still a hesitation around even something like a journalistic publication, let alone things you're going to publish and like what Paul says, you know, re release it to uh, community of products that can be consumed by community members that are not necessarily, um, you know, scholarly um, products. But I think, I mean, you know, listening to you, I, I feel that, you know, largely we we don't really have um, any momentum. I mean, would it be fair to say I don't really have any momentum around rethinking, you know. Um, community impact uh, measures or qualitative indicators as opposed to sort of this process, which I think we all did to survive, which is to translate and um, fashion scholarly products out of the co community engagement. There, there's no sort of trans transformation of the idea of how we rethink what impact looks like. So we take these pragmatic strategies of like, okay, um, you know, I'll turn, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll produce a scholarly uh, products, you know, while doing my community impact. And maybe sometimes I'll hide what I'm doing in the community impact and not make it count, even though I'm doing all of this uh, labor, or I try to turn it into something that registers as a traditional scholarly uh, product and, and get credit in it that way. I mean, I know of models and work with people who, with models, you know, basically at a post tenure level, where they've just decided that they will, you know, uh, engage at the community level and, you know, screw the, the promotion uh, process. Kevin Michael Foster is a very well-known academic at University of Texas, Austin, who's built up an incredible infrastructure of advocacy for African-American school children and families inside the Austin uh, school system. 
Um, but that work, which is very la laborious and um, you know daily, you know does not register as a scholarly product, but it's hugely impactful in terms of the needed activism, you know, for the African American community. But you know, in talking to him, it was a choice that he made basically to say, you know, screw the promotion to full. This means more to me, and I go this way. So you know, in such R1 institutions, even something that has made tremendous impact in the community does not actually is not legible in the in the uh, tenure process, and we don't have any vocabulary to sort of assess something like that. It's just seen as something um, that doesn't count. So I, I mean, I just my 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 thinking in my my reflection on hearing you say is that. It feels like at Tulane at this moment, you know, maybe there may be shifts in the future, but we haven't really gotten a conversation going about thinking about what impact is. We want to do community research, but our assessment model is still on the traditional level, largely, you know, so we, we're wanting to make community engagement fit into uh, the traditional model versus rethinking if we do community engagement, what is excellence, you know, like is Kevin Michael Foster's model excellence, you know, given the impact he's having for African American ad advocacy, you know, and, and you know, it's only 24 hours, some people may able, be able to do both. In my field of like activist anthropology, there are even methodological questions around, you know, the ethics of taking community knowledge and putting it into scholarly products, which makes for hesitations, you know, sometimes about creating uh, scholarly products out of these things. So there are a lot of questions that come up with the tactic of like in different areas, you know, and different fields about like, okay, we just have to, you know, take what, you know, uh, do, the, do the jig of being able to take the community engagement and then produce traditional products. And it seems to me that this is kind of what we have right now. We do not have mo momentum towards uh, you know, transforming the, the measures. Um, anyway, that, that's my reflection on hearing you say, not, not a critique, just a reflection. I think like that's, that's where we are, but it opens up, you know, the strategy that you outlined, which I think I've also done to some, some extent, you know, like, I mean, you know, I can speak of a couple of experiences. You know, I, I wrote this book around, you know, people's experiences trying to engage liberal democratic, you know, justice systems around police violence and racial attacks and largely the failures of those systems that you know illuminate both the UK and US processes. And it was adopted say by the San Francisco Public um, Defender's Office as a book to be utilized for you know, the public defender training. It was adopted as Black History Month book for the University of Essex. But really why I got my tenure was because it was published by UPenn, right? That's, that's the, I didn't even mention these things in, the, in my tenure cases. Right, because I didn't think it would it would actually matter that much. Um, and you know, like you know, book adopted for students at the University of Essex, you know, to lead with that doesn't really make sense. So I, I mean, it doesn't seem that we have changed that. And I and and so you know, the, 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 I would love to hear what other people have to say as well. Yeah, thanks, Mohan. I'd love to hear from other people as well. I mean, I think I don't know. Let's let's open the floor to, to have some other people chime in and then we can circle back around. Uh, yeah, if, if I may, I say I'm just a PhD student, but nonetheless, uh, with the Mellon program, we've uh, studied and read a lot of articles on these issues right here, what we're talking about and kind of how do you go for tenure? You know, do you have to, as Jordan was saying, uh, have to have the two going at the same time. But part of what I want to say is I just think it's, uh, we're going to slowly see with the old generation going out, retiring. Um, I'm hoping at least then we start seeing new people. So to me, it's more of a change of ethics in research. Um, I feel like the community engaged research it produces two things. One is more ethical, and I think you get better, more valuable um, research and information then as well. Um, but I think some of the old guard doesn't see it as, ethical or they don't see actually some of the old type of research as unethical, in my opinion, at least. And I think as the guard starts changing one by one, then I think there's going to be, the way I see it, 
opportunities, little windows that are going to open. We're going to have a provost like Jordan that says, no, put this on the very forefront. And when each of us have that opportunity, wherever people are through the nation, we have to be ready and go through that window with um, the community engaged uh, research at the forefront. Um, but in the meantime, what do we do? I guess that's the question. I think another thing that Paul said that I just chime in about, you know, the current provost and, and the discourse about showing impact. I mean, I was in a conversation with members in the provost office about, you know, the agenda of trying to uh, step up the national visibility of Tulane professors, you know, and one of the big priorities is about getting people into the, you know, the, the academies and, and things like that, and that we are, we are not measuring up you know, highly enough in that type of uh, indicator. Something like that is is not as as a as a kind of primary agenda doesn't lend itself easily to uh, looking at community engagement impacts, right? You know, it's going to require the traditional impacts, and that 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 the conversation I was in, that was the main thing. I mean, the new um, chief diversity officer actually her her major job in that uh, designation is is involving this project, you know, of trying to get uh, Tulane faculty members to register more highly in the national academies and things of that nature. So I think there's like an inherent, you know, tension, you know, around the discourses of community engagement and some of these institutional priorities that, that have sort of firm commitments behind them, I think. Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, there's a lot of efforts that are taking place to move the needle on, on exactly the themes that we're talking about. But my sense is that it moves very slowly. You know, I, I mean, I don't have, I don't, I wish I had better, better news to say, but I think that as somebody who is, you know, looking at coming up for a promotion and tenure, it's still, it's still, uh, you know, the, the same old metrics, I think, still really are the most important ones, it, are the most sure bet, you know, and I think that, that as someone who's pre-tenure, my advice is to someone who's pre-tenure is to, you know, try to find a way to, to make sure that you're still ticking those boxes. Because I, just on a very individual level, I mean, you don't want to be the person who's, who's, who people are grappling with and it's it's uh on a, on a very individual level i mean there's so much to which is depressing to say i mean i also agree with with what jared said that it is i do think it's a generational thing and i mean i you know when i first joined tulane 10 years ago the people that were you know senior professors many of whom have since um retired they were like openly you know, they were not just like ambivalent about community engagement. I mean, they were like actively against it. They, they felt like it detracted from scholarship. And I mean, to be honest with you, like my chair at the time, I had, I mean, I never convinced him otherwise. <laughs> like he wouldn't, he just did not support any of the community engaged work that I did, which was frustrating. But I do think that, you know, these things are changing. It takes time, but it is changing, but how, I just feel like, I mean, even at a school like Tulane, you know, you have this, you have this like on the one hand, you know, to Mohan's point, like at the one hand, you have this like very strong need or perceived need to like stay in the club of the AAU, which, you know, the American Association of Universities, which means, you know, having certain amounts of, of traditional scholarly productivity. Like when you look at what the AAU is using to evaluate universities, it's grants and publications. And you know, are you a member of the American Society, you know, the National Academy of Sciences, et cetera. And they're not asking questions about you know, like what sort of community engaged work you did. And Tulane has this huge drive to be in it. And yet at the same time, you know, Tulane is is one of the 
you know, in a, in a cluster of, of universities that is actually putting its money where its mouth is and investing in community engagement and in trying to have a societal impact. We could talk about how effective that is or not, but it's, it's, there's a real sort of like, um, you know, disconnect of schizophrenia that's going on within this university right now. And, and unfortunately, I mean, so you have, you know, you go, go to like the Tulane homepage and what are you going to see there is you're going to see like Tulane is the engaged university where, you know, we're engaged, we're moving the needle on societal issues in New Orleans, where look at all these great things we're doing for society. But then at the same time, like if you ask the president, what's the single most important thing that Tulane needs to do in the next five years, I would bet he's going to say it's remain in the AAU, the American Association of Universities, which means hewing to and doing better in those traditional metrics of scholarship. So it's kind of like a, an experiment in progress. I mean, it's interesting to see what's going to happen over the next few years at an institutional level at Tulane. And it's also interesting to see and to think about ways that, you know, as composition of these, as values change, as more emphasis is placed, not just within Tulane, but at the national level, on the university actually having to show some level of engagement, et cetera. Um, you know, there, I think there will be this slow change, but, but from the level, from the perspective of like the individual faculty member who's preparing their promotion and tenure materials, you know, I think that unfortunately it's in a place now where I feel like it is relevant. It adds, it adds value to what you're doing. I think it's seen and perceived positively. So Mohan, to your point about not having include, not even having mentioned, you know, those, those, those sorts of, you know, impacts in your materials. I think it's relevant to include that stuff, um, but it's probably not what's going to carry the day, you know, if you don't have the, the at least a certain threshold of, of scholarly productivity that they're looking for. I wish I had better news <laughs> to say. I can see how that's sort of deflating, but that's why, you know, I empty, I mean, I, I opened this whole conversation and I think as we're getting close to the end here, I'll close it too, but or get you know refocus it here about you know those of you who are pre tenure. I think you need to be thinking about how can I marry these two things in a synergistic way. What can I do to you know to find ways so that so that the one hand feeds the other, so to speak. So maybe we'll have another workshop with those of you that are particularly in that boat where what I had sort of envisioned we might do in this workshop is, is actually sort of workshop those, you know, those particular themes um, on an individual level. But we're not going to do that in the next, in the next eight minutes. So, <laughs> um, but is, I don't know. Oh. yeah, please, no question. Okay. There, it, there is an upcoming work. Um, session in at the end of April with uh, folks from the Office of Research and the Office of um, Foundations. And they're going to talk about different kinds of funding sources. And from what I hear from the director of the Office of Foundations um, is that foundations right now are very much interested in projects that carry social impact. And so that might be one way to look at how to combine both the traditional scholarship and community engagement through funding sources that can support both aspects. So um, look out in, in, for that information in the, in the newsletter that comes from CPS. Yeah, I do think that's a great comment actually, Miriam. And I, I think I mentioned this briefly at the beginning of the conversation, but I mean, for me, something that's, that's really been fundamental to my being able to tick those boxes in terms of scholarly production is getting precisely those kinds of grants from foundations that support, you know, they support because they see the positive societal impact, they support projects 
that also enable me to, um, you know, to do the scholarship or us to do the scholarship. So I think, you know, that's, that's the, the, the challenge and the opportunity for community engaged researchers is to envision and, and, and get funding for and implement these projects that, that do both. And the funding is out there. It definitely is. I mean, I think that's, you know, Miriam, I wish I, I had maybe emphasized this more early on, but I think that's the way to do these projects is through, um, is through foundational and donor support and sometimes federal agencies um, that, you know, that are willing to fund these. I would, I would add on to that. I mean, just as somebody who recently we, we, we were up for the Mellon Foundation grant. I mean, when, when we had a conversation with deans and with uh, the provost, with the Mellon Foundation, the folks from the foundation were, were pushing for more writing, more, more in writing about the, uh, in terms of promotion and tenure decisions um, that would establish that community engaged uh, scholarship was, was, uh, was valued because they were like, you know, <laughs> how can we ask, how can you ask, you know, professors to do this kind of work if you're not explicitly valuing it? And, you know, to hear, you know, you'd hear the, the provosts and the, and the deans were, were talking about how, oh, yes, we value it. And they're like, where is it in writing? We need to see your writing. And so, the, so I think these foundations um, are also, you know, I, I don't know that, that they can fight against the AACU, but I think that, they, that there is also, that, that just adds to the kind of Maybe the incoherence, but also, but at least the, the tension between, you know, the mission of 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 Tulane University, what you see on their homepage, and uh, and you know what they actually are are able to value. So I think like there these these foundations that can be also allies in this particular way, and and they know too like to get grants from the Mellon Foundation, they've got Tulane has to at least. Um, they, they need to be inching towards that and those and and I think that's I mean that's what I don't I won't go yeah I'll, I'll, I'll end it there Ryan without going into much too much detail I'm just curious what what actually got ended up put in put on paper on those. yeah I'll I'll uh, yeah I can I can actually I there was a paragraph in our in our grant proposal where they described it, and they said, you know, it's it's required as part of the dossier. Uh, this that or this this is part that's included in the dossier. I, I can I'll give you the exact wording that they put forward. I think they did just they didn't like. Um, you could see that that they were trying to say pay lip service to it and like say yes we value it. Um, as you would to an organization, but I think that uh, I think they did enough to placate the Mellon Foundation. But I think like the, they were the Mellon Foundation was pushing for much more because they're like I think they realize. I mean, they know the game. I mean, they they know like we need we need more of this to happen in order for. Um, it, 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 we need more of this to happen. It's like this long-term battle, but we we, we don't want to open the door. At least you, you've at least you've gone on record saying that you're for it and you want to value it and you want to reward it. Um, I mean, I'll say too that like this is this is this is like we've seen it we've seen it in conversations with at the provost and dean and chair level with like everybody sort of pointing at everybody else. Like the provost is like, oh, I can't force people to do things that aren't um you know they, then then the chairs will feel like i'm pushing them but the chairs don't want to do it if they're not signaled that it will be accepted by the provost and you know so it's all everybody sort of the 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 mechanics of it every sort of pointing at everybody else so it's i i don't know i mean <laughs> yeah i can show i don't the long and short of it is not a huge amount of progress was made even though they were pushed yeah, that sounds about right. We're coming to the end of our session. Um, does anybody have any other question or comment to close us out? 
Thank you all for attending. Thank you so much, Jordan, for this informative session. Yeah, thanks. I'd just like to say before we click off that um, for those of you that have hung around to this point, if you guys would like to, I'd be happy to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you about the particulars of, of your situation and, and um, you know, to just kind of, I, I can't promise to have any easy answers. I'm sure if, if there was, but if there's challenges that you would just provide some feedback or perspective on, I'd be happy to do that. So um, just follow up with me by email and we can, we can set that up. And that includes Thanks. people that, that aren't at Tulane too, Pamela. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks very much. Thank everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.